Hello, my name is David Robinson. I'm a reader in archaeology at the University of Central Lancashire, and I am really happy to be here to talk about enhanced reality, new possibilities in immersive virtual archaeology, an exciting new field, and it's a topic that uh, we can get into right now. I suppose I started on this journey myself, working with the Patoti group, who recorded Valcomonica rock art, otherwise known as Patotis, in northern Italy. And here I am in the uh, University of Weimar virtual reality lab with my colleague uh, Lila Yannick, and we're working on this multi-context data exchange. And here you can take 3D representations of uh, petroglyphs, carvings, and look at them uh, from a God's eye view from one uh, data um, uh, source and transfer that over onto a screen. And this is great for analytical work in the lab to be able to zoom into and explore rock art on the very smallest scale, uh, pretty much from the viewpoint of an ant. And you can work to the peck barks and the different taphonomic processes which actually create the rock art. So this is excellent in order to work in the laboratory in order to understand the art. But of course, my work doesn't really focus on Italy. My work instead focuses on South Central California in the wonderful lands of the Wind Wolves Preserve, located north of Los Angeles. And in these hills, you have these fantastic sandstone formations and other kinds of formations which have incredible world-class archaeology, including some amazing rock art, which I'll talk about later. But also, we have been recovering some of the world-class basketry made by the California uh, Indians and their descendants in some of these dry caves. And we've been employing the latest technological equipment, such as laser scanning, as well as photogrammetry here, which is being performed by Devlin Gandhi of the University of Cambridge. And he is recording a cache of baskets that he uses a photograph to create many different angles and from that to create a reproduction of the cache itself. And here you can see that model that he created. And with that, you can look at the assemblage itself, but also you can pull out the individual artifacts and look at them in detail. So for instance, here we can see this fantastic water bottle and it's a twined example, which is common for this part of California. Um, it has, uh, you can see some repairs that have been made to the neck, part of the water bottle, which typically has the most damage. And this kind of work then, it helps not only in the laboratory analysis, but helps in disseminating that information through various online means. And we've, we published this work in this paper in the uh, SAA journal, uh, Advances in Archaeology. And you can visit that paper. It's open access. You follow the links by Eleni Katula, who produced the 3D models using a technique called reflective transformation imaging. And here you can see the model she created from a seed beater, which came from Cache Cave. And if you visit the paper and follow the link here, you will be able to examine the seed beater in close detail. So what we're trying to do is use these virtual techniques to enable not only research to take place in labs, but also for that research then to be able to go online and allow people to be able to uh, research these objects uh, from the comfort of their own computers. Here's another basket from Cache Cave, a small personal coiled tray. And you can see that the function here allows you to cast light from different directions across the object and be able to zoom in and even look at pretty close high magnification in three dimensions of the actual object itself. The creation of these 3D models is also extremely useful to the local Native Americans whose ancestors actually made these objects. Sandra Hernandez of the Tohon Indian tribe explains how some of this is impacting the tribe as they use our virtual reality outputs. With this demonstration here with the baskets, this was definitely one of the favorites mm. of, of our group. Um, I think one of the interesting things um, that was just shared was, you know, that normally we're not able to pick these items up, you know, with our hands. We're not able to, you know, examine them closely. And the first time my daughter took part, one of my daughters took part in the virtual reality, she was hesitant 
to virtually pick up that basket. It took her several <laughs> moments of feeling okay to be able to do that. And I thought that that was so interesting. Um, the reverence that, you know, we have and hold for a basket piece, any basket pieces that are, that are found or that are in museums, but for her to kind of take that in and still hold that in, in this virtual format you know we had to keep reminding her it's okay you can you can look at it you can turn it over you can touch it you can even drop it and pick mm -hmm. it back up um but even with the um the elder group that was something that i found was you know not all of our elders that's an arduous climb to get up into mm -hmm. that particular cave that we're showing with the um art it's, it's a hard climb to get in and our, some of our elders can't do that. So mm. this virtual ability to be able to do it really um, kind of pushed some of the activity in terms of, yes, we are welcoming a VR and what more can we do with VR? The inclusion of language specifically, um, like colors and mm. or directional um, will be something that we're moving forward um, there on the future um, on the tribe's end to work with this. But it's been a wonderful tool. So you can read about the interactions that we've had with different user groups, including the native uh, Tohon tribe, in this paper that was, again, open access publication in uh, a journal called Interacting with Computers. But now I'd like to talk about how this idea of enhancing reality, because one of the things that virtual reality is allowing us to do is to experience the archaeology in ways never before possible. So here we have the documentation of the rock art site Plato, which is uh, recorded in normal light as well as in de-stretch light. So this is an enhanced technique that brings out different uh, aspects of the color spectrum. And when you're in the 3D environment, you're able to tack back and forth using this flashlight tool between the normal textures as well as the 3D de-stretch textures. Adding into this, we've included bow and arrows in order to enliven the technology, to allow the user to be able to have interactive experiences with the artifacts rather than simply having them be static images. And of course, this can be a lot of fun doing this, but this bodily engagement in the virtual reality environment to be immersed within this kind of technology brings to it other theoretical issues of how these kinds of technologies are changing how we relate with archaeology itself. We have written about this in this paper, When the Virtual Becomes Actual, in this book, uh, Ontologies of Rock Art, that you can see here. But it leads to us thinking more deeply about how we can further engage with the archaeology through the use of immersive technologies. So we are now working on techniques to allow the user to engage in rock art again in ways which simply would not be possible normally. So here you can see the user is able to select individual elements and pull them off of the rock surface itself in order to create their own library of images. And they can explore these images on their own. They can actually take the rock away with it. And this allows a more personal engagement with the paintings themselves uh, here at the site of Pleito. This kind of technique then would allow the user to be able to explore the series of superimposition throughout the, the site that just simply is impossible in an and so this is why we like to call this kind of virtual reality an enhanced reality because we're bringing to the plate the ability for the user to experience sites in novel and innovative ways but importantly, there's the whole spectrum of intangible aspects of these sites that we can also include in these immersive environments, including sound. So we include the welcome song, sung by Jake Hernandez of the Dahon Indian tribe. The first time, to our knowledge, that Native American song has been recorded at the site of Pleito. Yahe, yahe, we angua. Yahe, yahe, we angua. Yahe, yahe, we angua. Yahe, yahe.
Thank you all for listening and watching this video, and I will just leave you now with the sounds of Plato, recorded on site itself in this enhanced reality.